We've examined the simplest, the most common fundamental bifurcations out there, but they're not all there is. There are other, more degenerate bifurcations out there. Here's an example. Consider what happens at x equals zero in the following system. Continuous time, dx dt equals mu squared x minus mu x squared minus mu x cubed plus x to the fourth. Now, what happens to this guy? Well, it kind of looks like a transcritical. You've got that constant times x minus constant times x squared out in the front. But what happens when mu equals zero? Well, when mu equals zero, that linear term goes away, but the quadratic term goes away, and that cubic term goes away, and you're left with an x to the fourth. That does not match any of the patterns that we have seen for saddle node, transcritical, pitchfork, none of that. So let's dig in. Let's figure out what is going on here. I write out that right-hand side, and aha, this one factors into the product of quantity mu x minus x squared times mu minus x squared. Now that first term, mu x minus x squared, that's a transcritical bifurcation. That's the normal form. And it's followed by the normal form for a saddle node bifurcation. So what we have in this degenerate bifurcation is really a superposition of transcritical and saddle node bifurcations. Now as to what that degenerate bifurcation looks like, well, that's not much of a mystery. If we plot out in the x mu plane where the equilibria are, we see that we have the equilibria for a saddle node and we have the equilibria for a transcritical. Now we can do what we have just learned as far as a continuation method to figure out the stabilities of these branches. So I could take a point where mu is zero and x is really, really large. What happens in that case is that dx dt is x to the fourth a positive number. So that means that x is increasing over on this right-hand side. I can propagate out positive, negative, positive, negative, and then infer the stabilities of all these branches. So that's what this very degenerate bifurcation looks like. But let's think about this. Even though we were able to make sense of this bifurcation, it sure doesn't seem like that's the kind of thing that you would run into in a physical system. It seems as though something like this would be really rare or fragile. Well, that intuition is correct. And what I want to do is explore that for a few minutes. Let's begin by asking ourselves, what happens if we take a bifurcation and bump it or perturb it? How robust is it to perturbation? Let's begin with something simple, the simplest one, the saddle node bifurcation. dx dt equals mu minus x squared. And what I'm going to do is bump it. I'm going to add some very, very small low order terms in that Taylor expansion. So now let's look at dx dt equals mu minus x squared plus a naught plus a1x plus a2x squared, where a naught, a1, a2, these are very, very small parameters. How have things changed? Well, I'm going to take that right-hand side and I'm going to sort it out in terms of lowest order terms in the Taylor expansion about zero. So my zeroth order terms in X are mu plus a naught. My first order term is a one X and my second order term is minus quantity one minus a two X squared. Now let's think. For the saddle node, the right-hand side, mu minus x squared, what is that? In the mu x plane, that's a parabola. And the coefficient in front of that x squared term is negative. Now, after we've perturbed it, we still have a second order equation. We still have a parabola. And the coefficient in front of that x squared term is still negative. Why? Because a2 is very, very small. In fact, if I do a little bit of fancy factoring, some completing the square type stuff, then what I get is in the form of a saddle node bifurcation. But instead of happening at mu equals zero, it's happening away a little bit. At negative a1 squared over four times quantity one minus a2 plus a naught. And it's not happening at x equals zero. It's happening at x equals a1 over two times quantity one minus a2. Whatever those terms don't matter. What matters is that we perturbed a saddle node and we got a saddle node. 
Saddle nodes are persistent under perturbation. They are robust. That is one reason why you see saddle nodes all over the place in physical systems. You can take that pure normal form, bump it, you still get a saddle node. Now what happens if we do this to a transcritical bifurcation? So I'm going to take that normal form mu x minus x squared and I'm going to add some perturbation a naught a1x a2x squared. Now how have things changed when these parameters are really, really small? Again, I'm going to sort terms out by degree. I get a naught, and then mu plus a1 times x, and then minus quantity 1 minus a2x squared. Great. But now this bifurcation depends greatly on the sign of that zeroth order term a naught. If a naught is positive, then this gives us a pair of saddle node bifurcations, one of them opening up, one of them opening down. On the other hand, if a naught is negative, then this gives us two separate branches of equilibria, one stable, one unstable, and no bifurcation. That bifurcation is completely gone. We've perturbed it away. Transcriticals, unlike saddle nodes, are not persistent under perturbation. They're not robust. And if we want to know what this looks like, well, we can plot things in the mu x plane. And we can look at what happens when a naught is zero, we get a transcritical. When a naught is positive, it breaks a certain way and we get, aha, we get this pair of saddle nodes. Whereas if we turn the dial the other way and we say, oh, if a naught is negative, then what do we have? Ah, these two branches split, one to the left, one to the right. You see how the stabilities match up. Now, if you really want to do this right, then you think about this as a two-parameter family where our parameters are mu and a naught. And then instead of plotting in the mu x plane, we plot x against mu and a naught. And in this full three-dimensional picture, the equilibria form this two-dimensional sheet with a singularity at the bifurcation point. What we have done is we have unfolded the transcritical bifurcation. Now this is very cool, but this should raise a bunch of questions. First of all, we haven't talked about what happens with higher order terms in the perturbation. One can argue that those don't really matter. It's not gonna be a problem. But what about the other bifurcations? What about a pitchfork? Is that equally brittle? Is there a way to quantify degeneracy to say that one type of bifurcation is more degenerate than another? This is just the beginning of our story on unfolding bifurcations. But with the simple amount that we have done, we can see that it leads to a much better understanding. Now, of course, everything, everything goes back to Taylor expansions, but there's more going on here than just a Taylor expansion.